This is Sue of Pursue the Dream, and I'd like to tell you a story I just discovered. The story begins when these two individuals left their respective clan families and traveled down their particular rivers until they met where the two rivers converged. Following the river a few more miles, they would then turn west and make their way into what is known today as the Valley of Fire. The purpose of this journey was to provide the young boy with an extended hunting, training, and survival experience as preparation for him to be recognized as an adult. After arriving at the Valley of Fire, they immediately got involved in the boy's hunting and survival skill development. They deliberately and systemically worked their way through the region of intriguing Red Hills as they pursued local game. In the process of hunting the local animal life, they took four side excursions into different areas of the valley. Each of these lasted about five days. They finally worked themselves to the far west end of the Valley of Fire. There they spied some previously recorded petroglyphs situated about 60 feet up a steep sloping solid rock hillside. Curiosity must have drawn the boy up the inclines to examine the petroglyph. Leaving his hunting tools at the base of the hillside, he made his way up the cliff until he arrived at the site of the petroglyphs. This was a very narrow ledge just below the petroglyphs that sloped away from the site at a downward angle, then turned to a steeper angle the rest of the way to the ground below. The boy, while negotiating this embankment, trying to reach and read the petroglyphs, somehow lost his balance and plunged uncontrollably down the face of the sawtooth incline. On his way down that 60-foot high cliffside, an awful scraping and tearing of the boy's body, skin, and muscles took place. This would have been followed by a bounceless sudden stop of an already mangled body as it landed on the hard desert floor. The man rushed to his side and found him still alive, but in excruciating pain. Working with the boy at the spot where he lay, the man attempted to assist him as best he could. Eventually, with the man's assistance, the boy attempted to move, but failed in his repeated attempts. He was too badly injured to move and had to submit to a very confined movement. In the aftermath of the accident and as time passed, the man eventually found a shelter for the boy in a hollowed-out depression carved out of the weather in the rock hillside. The injured boy remained there in this natural cave for a number of days in much pain, attended to by the man. A later petroglyph picture of the boy and man shows that the boy's right leg is amputated at the knee. The fall would have broken his leg to the extent it had to be removed. This operation would have had to have been done soon after the fall, probably with a crude knife and without the benefit of any pain-killing medication. During this time, the man and the boy considered their possibilities for survival. Such possibilities, were, at best, were very minimal and discouraging. They knew of the importance of returning to the boy's village where he could be cared for, but they were many miles from the nearest town. After quite a number of days of healing, the boy's pain and overall affliction had not significantly improved. In addition, the conditions necessary for their survival were rapidly disappearing. The man knew that their successful return to the clan's village was absolutely necessary if the boy's life was to be saved. The one thing that they determined to do was to petition a being of higher power, their god, for help, because they raised their hands high above toward the heaven and beseech their god. To survive, they needed water, and the closest source was the Virgin River, 10 miles downhill. On foot, that would be not a very difficult task, but the boy depended entirely on the man, and that simple journey took them four days. After reaching the river, the man knew that he'd have to leave the boy there while he went a greater distance for help. He would have fashioned some kind of simple shelter, probably from river willows, for his young friend's comfort and protection. And before leaving the boy alone beside the flowing river of water, the man would have obtained some type of wild food to sustain the injured boy in his absence. 
The man then set out alone in a hurried trot to the boy's village to recruit help in rescuing the boy. At least three individuals were pressed into service as a rescue team to locate the boy and bring him home. Included in this rescue team was a large and strong man who was capable of carrying the injured boy home if necessary, probably the boy's father. The rescue team was able to return the injured boy back to the village where he received additional attention to his wounds and was assisted in recovering from his other injuries. Since the lower right leg was amputated, the recuperation period was much longer. During this time, he had to walk about with an improvised wooden crutch. Looking back at their ordeal, these two individuals realized that their journey consisted of many extremely large and meaningful experiences which tested their resolve to the extreme. Later, the man and the boy felt they needed to somehow bring closure to their ordeal. So they did so by figuratively and mentally capturing and disposing of the fears they experienced and internalized. These were the fears that were generated in their great injury and in the times of misery and despair especially as they acknowledged that almost too real possibility of, of their dying there so far away from family and friends. They reviewed the sequence of events of their endurance and their determination to live. They acknowledged and recognized in hindsight how important it was to be aware of safety factors in the pursuance of such training experiences. They realized it in this after-the-fact an analysis that they had faced and conquered the desperate feelings generated in them from this event. They realized that they had benefited much from personally accomplishing their, lo their long trip back to civilization, and in the process they conquered their feelings of helplessness and despair. This resolution of this calamity included the recognition that in the long run, this had been a spiritual experience for both of them. They explained their feelings in the framework of an imaginative trail that included some of their most real, frightful, and meaningful experiences. At the end of this mental trail, they were able to personally find themselves in control of all that they had experienced. come to look at the rock and see the atlatl, having some understanding maybe that it's very old, but they don't really understand the petroglyphs. And if you ask, you're told, who knows, it could be anything. But that always seemed ridiculous to me. Somebody knows. This information has been passed down somewhere. So I came across this book, Basket Makers 2, and in it he interprets four famous petroglyphs, one of them being this one on at Valley of Fire. Is it true? I don't know, but I think it's a lovely story. This young boy went into the hills to become a hunter, a man of his clan. And in the process, he met the possibility of his own death and ultimately became a warrior, fearless, more than he had ever thought possible. A great spiritual transformation had taken place. It is the story of all journeys.